thank you participants for being here. Let me quickly just introduce, uh, you know, I had kept around three minutes to introduce both our panelists. I realized that this is not going to be even half the time I require. So please do bear with me while I introduce these fantastic panelists we have today. So first we have Nana. Nana uh, Lal Kedwai is, I mean, everyone knows who she is. She is, uh, the, uh, today she is a senior advisor for Rothschild, a senior advisor at Advent India, a member of the mission board at the EQ Futures Fund, the non-executive director on several boards, past president of FIKI. Uh, she retired in 2015 as the uh, executive director on the board of HSBC Asia PAC and chairman of HSBC India. Uh, in 2018, April, she uh, retired from the global board of Nestle. She's one of India's first uh, Harvard MBA uh, uh, products and she's received several awards and honors, including the prestigious Padma Shri for her contribution to trade and industry. And she's engaged with institutions that are close to my heart as well. So environment, water, sanitation, and the empowerment of women. She's authored three uh, fantastic books, uh, bestsellers among them, 30 Women in Power, Their Voices and Stories, and Survive or Sink, a national agenda for sanitation, water, pollution, and green finance. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for being here and, and, and for taking our time. Uh, it, it's an honor. Thank now you. I'd like to introduce, uh, uh, I'd, I'd introduce uh, Mrs. Ganesh, who's, who's uh, uh, one of India's best known uh, healthcare entrepreneurs. So as a chairperson, uh, Amina heads Porti, our medical, India's largest and fastest growing home healthcare company, which she co-founded in 2013. I personally have used services and I'm blown away. Uh, uh, the company has about 5,000 employees, uh, operations across 16 cities, and it brings in-home uh, uh, care to patients, the full range of, of geriatric, chronic, uh, post-operation care, which is, which is really important for a company like ours, where, where medical beds are less. Uh, till February 2013, Meena was a promoter and a board member of Tutor Vista, the CEO of Pearson's Education Services, acquired by Pearson's, one of the world's top education service companies. Uh, now, this is where it gets a lot of it interesting. She's also a partner at uh, platform uh, growthstory.in, and through that, she's invested in some fantastic businesses in India, category leaders, Big Basket, Home Lane, Fresh Menu, Bluestone. Uh, um, I mean, as far as awards go, we are up there. So she's got the ET Startup Award for the Women's Head category in 2016, was chosen as the Healthcare Entrepreneur of the Year in 2016 as well at the Indian Healthcare Summit. And has been, I think, for the for six consecutive years, part of the 50 most powerful women in business in India. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Meenaji, for being here. This is, I mean, I can't wait to start this. I don't want to take any much more time and hog any more of this space. I'll I'll let it. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm opening it to every uh, to to you both, and I'll, I'll I'll let you take it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Somvir, and. Uh... Let me just say that uh, it's always such an honor to interact with Meena, and we are so fortunate to have her with us today, given all that she does. Uh, so Meena, to really kickstart this session, uh, my first question to you is, you decided to enter the startup universe in the late 90s, early 2000s, at a time when many of us were really just chasing jobs in India. Talk to us about why and how you went about that. What inspired you and uh, what got you started? Thank you, Nena. But before we start, I'm say, I must say that I'm a huge fan of you, uh, not just your corporate career, but your post-corporate uh, career, uh, the kind of uh, initiatives and interventions that you're doing, which are so important for all of us. So thank you for whatever you've done and set a standard and being a mentor and a uh, role model for a lot of uh, other women out here. Not just women, but for men as well. So uh, talking a little bit about my journey of uh, becoming an entrepreneur, um, it was the year 2000 when I started my first company uh, called Customer Asset, which was in the BPO sector. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, working with Microsoft. I was uh, leading uh, some of India's uh, business units for Microsoft. And uh, uh, my husband has been an entrepreneur even 10, 10 years earlier and people uh, didn't have the word called entrepreneur. We only said businessmen, right? So there was no such word. In 1990, he started. So I'd had some exposure to how challenging and how crazy it is to be an entrepreneur uh, even before I started. Uh, but in 2000, uh, 1999, 2000, actually, I came in contact with a lot of uh, 
startups in the software space uh, through the work that I was doing in Microsoft. My role was to work with uh, various uh, software companies, application developers of all hues and colors and move them to the Microsoft platform. That was, uh, I was evangelizing that and that was my main role. As I spent a lot of time working with many of them, uh, the, the spark started to grow in me that I could be, build something uh, of this nature. Why not? I want to do it. However, what was also clear to me is that trying to build yet another uh, startup in the software space and tech star, software space didn't make sense to me at that point in time. It's not that I had a very um, a differentiated idea of a new uh, product that I could create in the software space. So I looked sideways and I found that BPO was a very uh, absolutely nascent and emerging space at that time. And uh, India was seen as, was uh, written to be the next big BPO capital of the world, the next big outsourcing capital of the world. So I started to explore that and that's what uh, got me off uh, onto becoming of. So a very interesting starting point of uh, the exposure you had, not just through your work, but also what your husband was doing. And we all get these exposures. Not every one of us gets this amazing entrepreneurial urge, which you demonstrated to actually plunge in and do it yourself. Uh, so, and this seems to be a recurring story. Uh, you went out to found uh, Portia. Uh, what made you decide to take the entrepreneurial plunge again in a completely new space as like home uh, healthcare? Yeah, so, uh, so Nana, after we sold, uh, I sold uh, uh, my first company, the BPO company, Customer Asset to ICICI One Source. Uh, that was uh, yeah, about 2003 or so. And then I was working with Tesco for a few years to help them set up their entire back office and tech set, um, set up in India as a CEO. Um, in the meantime, uh, we, uh, my husband and another co-founder had founded um, another company called Tutor Vista, uh, which was into the online education for the global space. So again, you know, watching them from the sidelines, I said, Mosh, I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. So I plunged into that and I became a co-founder of, um, of Tutor Vista. So that was in 2000, uh, 2000, 2008, 2008, I started that. Then into the, from 2008 to 2013 was our journey with Tutor Vista, which we then sold to Pearson Education in 2011, and we did the complete exit in 2013. So from 2011, uh, we started this uh, the growth story platform of identifying other areas where we believe good startups could be built. So that's, that gave rise to Big Basket and Bluestone in that period. In 2013, when I did the complete exit from, uh, uh, from uh, Pearson uh, and Tutor Vista, I had two options. One is to continue being a promoter, um, advisor, investor in uh, the many startups that we have founded since then. We have a, a portfolio of a dozen startups. Or to go and do one more startup where I was the operating head and the leader of that. I decided to choose the second part, uh, second path because I think I wasn't done yet in being uh, an operator. I wanted to build and I wanted to have the satisfaction of completely directing and actually making things happen. Um, and uh, that's, that led to me then exploring what should I do next. So um, healthcare had always been of great interest to me. Um, I had seen a lot from the sidelines. I have experienced as a patient. I've experienced as a caregiver to patients, but to my parents so who had, um, my father had cancer and uh, he passed away and so on. So I, I had experienced the, the challenges that the healthcare sector has. So it was in my mind is that if there was, I had an opportunity to do something disruptive in that, perhaps I should uh, go back and see what could that be. And I spent about six, eight months to explore what are the problems that are still there in the healthcare sector. Uh, of course, there are plenty and one can still enumerate all of them and saying that we are probably still uh, very far from having solved many of the problems. But one that really struck out to me was that while a lot of uh, investments had happened in the hospital sector uh, of various uh, types, you know, whether multi-speciality, quaternary, uh, single speciality uh, clinics and so on, there was nothing much that happened in the non-facility-based care. 
However, if you look at care, uh, healthcare, 70% of healthcare is actually outside of facilities, but no investments, no uh, clear organized player had uh, taken shape in that. Uh, and my own experiences also told me that it was the case. So the combination of my experience and what I studied in the market made me put the thesis together that there is something to be built over here. And that was the genesis of Portia in the year 2013. Of course, from what I started, I'm an outsider in the, in the healthcare space, from where I started to where uh, things have moved is very different. There's not, uh, it's, it's uh, transformed so many times over. Uh, it's amazing. Um, just following what the customers and the patients need uh, has helped us transform and becoming what we are today. But that, that really made me get back to being uh, another uh, CEO, starting up another company as a founder rather than being on the sidelines. So, you know, it's interesting to hear that you have not hesitated to plunge into areas which are not your core uh, space, as you yes. mentioned, healthcare, yeah. but you see the opportunity. And of course, the underlying base is the technology and platform that you're able to create to fill yes. up that need. Uh, you obviously have a terrific appetite for risk-taking because... Uh, you plunge in uh, when you see these opportunities. Where and what do you think lights that fire? That ability to see an opportunity and then to risk your time, your capital, your energy, because there's so many things out there that you might have done otherwise. Sure, sure. No, and I must also say that uh, this is not genetic. So let me be very clear. <laughs> I come from. <laughs> I come from a very, very sedate railway employee, parent, a father, and a homemaker mother. So it, it was not, no, none of us had seen anything. And I, in fact, I didn't even think I would have a career. That's the kind of uh, family that I grew up in. So I was expected to be a nice, you know, obedient housewife. <laughs> <laughs> Something changed along the way. So some mutation, gene mutated and made me do this. Luckily but, for all of us. Luckily <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. But I, what, what I think uh, has, uh, the, this accumulation of experiences that I have probably put together over the many years of work that I did before I became a startup person. Uh, each of the companies and each of the opportunities that I got were, uh, at least from the lens that I saw, were something which I could do something disruptive. I could do something new rather than just follow the footstep of what was done. So I think I got lucky. And probably I also have the proclivity to, to sort of gravitate towards those things, which the companies in which I was, I was with NIIT, then with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and then with Microsoft. In all of these places, I ended up gravitating towards those kind of opportunities, which required me to set up something from scratch, something which is not there. So that desire to constantly build something, uh, I think uh, has been developing and the pressure started sort of accumulating when the customer asset came in. The other thing is, I think also uh, on a lighter note, I never get anything right. So I have to keep doing it again and again. Maybe at some point in time, some startup of mine will be uh, a permanent thing which I stick with, which I think, I hope will be Portia. Yeah. Well, uh, I was actually just going to ask, it's uh, interesting to see uh, through your startup life, how you have set up and sold ventures. And uh, it's unusual to some extent because these are babies that you have created. And uh, how easy is it to actually uh, manage that uh, process? I can understand that it's compelling in terms of uh, the money that is put on the table, but uh, the emotional aspect yeah. And yeah. would you advise that this is the right way for startup uh, entrepreneurs to look at business, to see opportunities exit at the right time as well? So, Naina, when uh, any startup that I have uh, built from scratch, I don't go in thinking that, okay, in the next three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, I need to find an exit for myself. It's more about uh, that there is something exciting to be built here. Um, maybe I'm the right person to do that. I can make a difference here. I can create jobs or I can create uh, a transformation in people's lives. Whatever it is that's driving me at that point in time, that is really the driver. Now, why we sell, when we sell is a, of course, there is some element of, uh, yes, yeah, somebody puts a uh, offer on the table which you can't refuse. 
But more than that, I think that's not what drives, uh, drove these uh, decisions, but it was more about what is the right home for, the, for that company to be? Am I in the right place and in the right home currently? Or is it better to be that that company be part of something larger? And in both in the case of uh, uh, customer asset and Tutor Vista, uh, we felt that it was better that it be part of a larger organization. And that's when it could reach its full potential. Of course, if there was not enough money, we would have probably eked on, but there was money also. So I'm not saying that that doesn't attempt, but the primary driver is this. So if this is the primary driver, then you have to think about it as, you know, like you see, you gave the example of this is like your baby, but when you're, you know, if your baby is uh, become old enough to leave your home and she has to leave home, right? So I mean, what do you do? You can't say, okay, but I don't want you to go. So you have to do that. So whether you feel bad, emotional, whatever, you have to go through that. Now that said, um, at least in the healthcare space, I feel very differently because healthcare is a much, much longer journey. Any healthcare, and you know better than me, that the healthcare investments are, um, the ROE starts to come probably six, seven, eight years post investment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of time and effort that it takes to get to a place where the company has reached its potential. And in the home healthcare space specifically, COVID has really transformed how the, in, this whole industry is looked at. And uh, we are seeing some very interesting um, uh, tailwinds, including regulatory uh, payers looking at it differently than ever before. So it looks like uh, this, is, this should be a pivotal point for this industry to really take it. And it does sound like it's uh, at the one level, the need, but at the other, uh, the ability and indeed capability of people to uh, uh, move online in terms of advice and help and support. And uh, what better than someone like you with your understanding of the platforms and the technologies to provide that. So that linkage between technology and provision of critical services, whether it was in the education space or now in healthcare, I'm sure are going to be heartbreaking for uh, the sector. Uh, so how important was it for you to have that technology technical link? The fact that yeah. you were very comfortable with, with that aspect of uh, skill, which enabled you to uh, pick up on some of these uh, amazing growth stories. So uh, Nana, all the companies, so let me actually uh, flip the question. There are so many opportunities in India for building businesses. And um, a lot of people complain about the problems in India. And I say, okay, all of those are startups in the making. So just look, you know, let's look at the flip side. There's so much to do. Now the question is, where do I focus my energies on? So I have to go back and look at what is it that I can bring to the table? Yes, understanding of technology and ease with technology and knowing how technology can be a disruptor. Absolutely, I get it. I understand how to run large operations, multi-city, multi-scale, very complex. I know how to set the right uh, structures so that I can run those kind of businesses. Uh, and thirdly, I now over the last uh, uh, couple of decades have really understood consumer and what really drives consumer and what how do you build something which would be successful. So the confluence of your uh, right to win, so to speak, have to fall in place for you to say that this is an area that I want to work. In. I could, I mean, just because I know technology doesn't mean today that I can start something in the crypto space because I still haven't got my head wrapped around. I really, really need to understand. I need to feel it from within that yes, I can make a difference here. So that I think that confidence becomes super important, and that gives you the confidence that you yes, you can indeed build something which is disruptive because. Even if you don't know the sector, and that's the other piece like you had alluded to earlier, we, I, education was new to us, uh, healthcare completely new to me, but in each of these, if especially as an outsider, you will be able to see the cracks and the gaps much better than anybody else. Those within sometimes tend to feel mm -hmm. much more com comfortable with whatever they have created, but somebody from outside can see those cracks. So coming in from outside, uh, with a fresh perspective, of course, you team up with people who understand the sector. So you're not just like bullheaded running along and trying to do something which won't work. But that, I think that it's outside in perspective sometimes helps in 
uh, creating this. So I think that must give heart to all those entrepreneurs out there who feel that, you know, you have to jump in with all the expertise in the world in that space. And it's really good to hear that essentially it is to see the cracks and opportunities and recognize what your strengths are, of course, within that and then jump in to create uh, uh, the new thing. And it's much more about the skill sets, the creating of organizations, the ability to uh, uh, create uh, new startups. Uh, but one important space in there, which I think would be valuable for many who are looking to enter the startup universe, is uh, VC money uh, and yes. those first fundraisers. Uh, you've clearly been highly successful in doing that through your career and then again at Portia. What were some of the challenges you faced when you were scaling up some of these businesses? And what advice would you give to those who are looking to access funds or and VC money? Uh, sure, going ahead? sure. So, uh, obviously, life has changed very drastically when you look at the whole funding scenario over the 22 years that I've been an entrepreneur. Uh, when I started Customer Asset, there were uh, some total of probably three uh, entities in the country that would uh, give money to a startup. And, uh, uh, well, we managed to raise something initially, but we did have a lot of trouble raising second and third rounds and so on. And, of course, uh, that was a time when we there was a 9-11 issue and the whole um, uh, offshoring industry went through huge amount of panic cycles because nobody was traveling, no one wanted to come, no one wanted to give business to a different country. So uh, we went through all of that and struggled to raise the follow-up rounds in many cases. Finally, we did manage to raise, but the industry, um, the industry composition had changed. And most of the big uh, BPOs uh, or most of the BPOs were either a part of large organizations like Infosys and IBM and uh, Wipro, they all set up their set up or acquired, or uh, they were uh, large banks, etc. So you had to right. ally yourself with somebody who is probably already uh, very big in a different sector and probably can bring in the business, and hence you can grow the the, the actual delivery. So it, we had we struggled a lot in raising money during uh, during the customer asset days, managed to raise. But since the industry had changed, we decided that allying with the large player made more sense. And that's how the exit to ICICI one source happened. Now, fast forward to Juta Vista. Um, the starting point, we, uh, the thesis with which we uh, started Juta Vista was that we want to provide online um, education to people in the global markets, specifically US and other English speaking markets, using Indian teachers. Um, and that was something in the year 2007, 2008, nobody is thinking that way and people were laughing at it. And so many investors said, come on, yeah, what are you thinking? I know you guys are smart entrepreneurs, you've done it before, but this seems like a completely crazy idea. Why would people in the US want to learn from Indian teachers and you want to teach them math and English? I mean, come on. So, so that, that was... and. Uh, online tutoring today is a big buzzword and every, that's the thing, you know, but when we started, it was very, very early. So it was a struggle to get uh, the first round of investment. But then once we got the first round, thereafter, we were able to showcase the, uh, the growth and we were able to show how it was really a very valuable business. Then we had a lot of people joining the band back in. So especially if you're ahead of time and you're creating something which is disruptive, it can be difficult and challenging to raise money. Now, fast forward thereafter, once the Tutor Vista story was uh, apparent and everybody now suddenly started to, lauding, to laud us as uh, uh, prescient in the, uh, entrepreneurs who can see the trend before it happens. It's all, you know, what people see. I mean, we, were, we are still the same that we were, but they think different. Yes. So it was so much easier thereafter for whether it is for Big Basket or Blue Stone or for home lane or for Portia for us to raise money and so raise children. It's your own track record speaking for itself, but also the environment appears to be easier in that there's much. just more money available, which is good news, I think, for a lot of the startups today. You are an investor as well, Meena. You've obviously uh, put your money to work extremely well. What would you say are the things you look for uh, before you invest? Yeah. So a few things that are important in my mind. One is the, is this is this a real pain point waiting to be solved? Uh, do I think that the market for this is going to be big enough? 
will people pay and pay well so that you can actually make margins in the business that you're trying to do so will the unit economics actually stack up so that's the business economics the size etc that's important the second piece for me is always the entrepreneur how strongly do i feel that this entrepreneur is passionate he has got at least part of the skill sets is willing to get the rest of the skill sets to to really go the long haul um, and does, does do they have the mental strength to go through the down cycles that any in new startups will have and i'll promise you everyone i mean the largest of names have gone through down cycles there is no such startup which is going up 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 and up and no up it just doesn't happen so there will be ups and downs you have it in you to stick through that and still continue to ride whatever dream that you had built for yourself so those are the two immediate things that come to my mind which are super important uh, for me to look at you know mina i'm so struck by what you just said because when i put together a uh, uh, a book on 30 women ceos uh, their voices their stories and uh, they were largely ceos of large organizations uh, the uh, the traits which stood out there were absolutely the same as what you mentioned here yeah uh, passion for what they were doing so uh, uh, and from passion you know you had the hard work and uh, uh, the strength to actually pursue that uh, vision uh, which is i think pretty much what you say the second which uh, was a very important aspect was uh, this issue of mental strength that you raise and how to deal with failure so every one of these women uh, 30 women in the book talk about how they if we all fail as you rightly say but their ability to pick themselves up start again use that failure and learning therein and mm-hmm. lean on others uh, emotionally mentors uh, uh, to get out of that hole were Absolutely. all very critical aspects in their career so it sounds like the traits whether to succeed in a startup world or in an organization are very similar when we look at it in a third which i think you also due to is the ability to keep learning I mean, look at yourself you've gone from one industry to another uh, so to always recognize that uh, we can be out there learning and uh, you know there's one of my favorite sayings there is mahastavira sandarakshita to know what we do not know is the beginning of wisdom so to just stay as a perennial student so i think uh, what you know you are a quintessential example of someone who has uh, marshaled these uh, characteristics these traits which really leads me to uh, actually laud everything you have done because uh, of the traits that you yourself have demonstrated now women owned businesses uh, and clearly everything you've done thus far is not necessarily women specific at all but for the women out there that uh, have uh, repeatedly come back to say that there's they they have difficulty in accessing capital uh, despite the promise of impact and returns of some of the ventures that they've put forward uh, what uh, advice would you have and what could the reasons be for why they feel or believe that the challenge is greater than their male counterpart you know yesterday i went to a party that was hosted by a vc the very big name i had to look like this where are the women okay so there are so few women both in the investor sector as well as in the in the entre- amongst the entrepreneurs it is a real problem i mean you have to work doubly hard and you have to be doubly ca- capable for you to be visible and for you to be seen as somebody worth backing so it is i personally since by the time i came to becoming a startup person i had already a lot of years of uh, corporate experience and some level of track record perhaps i got it easy i i got off easy but a lot of uh, women who are uh, probably much earlier in their career are jumping straight after after maybe just a couple of years after graduation they have a brave, brilliant idea they want to get in they do find it difficult because the whole uh, the start the startup ecosystem both the the funding side and the supply side both are highly male dominated so it is a challenge for them uh, i do hope and i see that at least the vcs are making a lot of effort to induct more women at the entry level so they will grow and they will become but you you know the sector i mean you can count on your one hand how many women are there who are 
partners, never mind leaders of uh, any PCP firms. But the interesting thing is that there have been a lot of bankers, so it's not that they don't understand financials, uh, mm -hmm. industry, so they have BFSI, fantastic, so many women. But when you come to the PEAGC sector, not really. So there's something which is, uh, that, that, that they have really need to do some introspection as to why they're not able to uh, attract enough women and retain them so that they can grow through. So that's one aspect, I believe, which, which comes in the way because um, there, is, there is probably a, a, a preconceived bias or um, an un, unsaid bias that maybe women are not going to see it through, maybe women are not too serious, they're just doing this as a hobby, um, can we really support them? So maybe these are unsaid things, but some of them are certainly uh, in there in people's minds. Is That's one perspective. The second thing I think women themselves and a lot of women entrepreneurs that I've spoken to are, uh, they, they, they have a lot of reservations when it comes to what are known as the hard skills. They are very, they're probably comfortable creating the product they, they know. And I'm not talking tech product, I'm talking yes. across industry. They're probably comfortable doing that. Uh, they're probably are very good in promoting that. But when it comes to hardcore selling, working, uh, literally working uh, on the street, to get uh, things going for them or to work with the in investors and be savvy in how you talk to an investor to create both the confidence level and to negotiate terms, I think they, they tend to lack a little bit of confidence in that. So uh, some amount of support, uh, some amount of mentoring, role modeling, uh, I'm sure would be very valuable. Third is of course a more bigger societal issue. It took many years and you guys, uh, you, Naina, you've been they're ahead of me uh, uh, setting a path for women to be in corporate. Um, now that's okay. I mean, yeah, women should study. They should have a career and they should be having a career which is nice and easy and like a, a, a calm sea. It should not be a roller coaster. Roller co and a cause startup is a roller coaster. Right? Nobody wants women to be in a roller coaster because, oh my God, then who will run the household? You know, women can have a nice job. They'll do on their computer and then they'll take care of their home. That's still the expectation. So that's a larger problem that I think will take a long while to start uh, to overcome. I think. Yeah. So it is It is sad to hear that in this day and age, these biases exist. In fact, uh, they exist for uh, the larger corporate job environment as well, although much better than yes. when uh, I started for my career or indeed you started. But yes. the fact that we're still discussing that it is a challenge is always so disappointing but we must be very away at it. Uh, would uh, the fact that, you know, I was quite struck that uh, in a lot of successful startups, it's not just one person. There've been groups of two and three people who have uh, come in together and worked yeah. on uh, that startup journey. Could that be a way that, you know, women uh, uh, also participate, that uh, they go in with a cohort, which uh, maybe counters some of these uh, unfortunate biases? Uh, you know, male members with them uh, sure, bringing yeah. the hard skills is would that be a solution? Uh, yes, they, that could be, and some may some of the women do that. I personally believe that uh, it's uh, it's very useful to have um, uh, co-founders rather than try to go through this journey all on your own because of all the things that I mentioned earlier. So having co-founders is very helpful. Co-founders, or at least you uh, early on in your journey, you bring in. Um, people who are like co-founders, but may not be co-founders, but they are part of your early management team who, who sort of compensate for those skills that either you don't have or you, you're not confident about. No, but, but Nana, at one point, I feel sad if that's the only way we can sort the problem, that I have to get a man in tow and say, this is my man, see, you can fund him, not me. I don't want it to be that way, right? Yes. I want to, that the women should be able to stand on their own of course, they need if they everybody has uh, skill gaps, right? Nobody is full. They you need all those people, but you should be able to stand on your own and be recognized for your capability and not not necessarily you know, the gender. But uh, you know that's a journey, of course. Yeah, and maybe the answer is that uh, the first venture is in this format. But once you establish your credentials, after all, your own yes. journey from that's BPO true. to Portia was uh, you know had its share of challenges but improved at every step as you got better known. So maybe that becomes a solution for any startup actually. Why just women-led startups? 
And maybe we don't have to be too ambitious to try and do it on our own in the first place, whether man or woman. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, you talked about mentors. Uh, so what were the mental support systems that you were able to access and what advice would you give to young startups today in terms of seeking uh, mentors, whether men or women? Sure. So in uh, each of the startups, especially because my startups were in industries which I was not very familiar with, having mentors who had the subject matter expertise was super important. Uh, the people who I could run to and say, you know, will this even work? Is it a stupid idea? How do I overcome the biases that are there, the outsider bias that uh, I would face? Uh, how do I overcome that? So those are, so it was very helpful to, so that was one set of mentors that at every point in time that I did uh, go into. The other kind of mentors that I have looked at people who uh, probably have, um, especially in early days where, uh, I didn't know enough about the whole uh, funding industry, what kind of questions to ask, what kind of terms are okay, what, what should I negotiate for, what should I, what should I let go and what's not important. Uh, that, that was certainly something I needed a lot of uh, uh, coaching and support from, not just uh, because of skill gap, but also it's, uh, uh, it didn't, it, I must say, it didn't come so naturally to me. I did need it much harder to make sure that I was able to stand up and uh, do those conversations on my own. So clearly you had the ability to reach out, but how did you find these mentors? What were the, the processes, systems, relationships you were able to capitalize on? And what advice would you have for a startup today in terms of how to find these mentors and make sure that uh, they get their time uh, yeah. and uh, advice? See, the good thing is that today it's uh, so much easier to find people who have uh, uh, either built startups or are industry experts and are they want to be they are available they ask them to be part of startup journeys because they think it's exciting and there is something that they can bring to the table so finding especially subject matter experts or people who have been there done that have invested have um, have uh, built businesses have succeeded failed there's a lot more of uh, just enough of supply available of these kind of people for us to reach out and uh, connect with. And you know, a lot of people will reach out to me through LinkedIn, then Thai is there. And there are all many, many fora that are now available through which you can reach out. What is What becomes important is to find the right level at which you want to interact. I mean, if somebody who's a, a, a brand new startup, who's just absolutely in the early stages, uh, would benefit from somebody who's probably two steps ahead of them rather than some a very large corporate which, or somebody who's become a, a large I mean, a corporate now. That's not the right thing. So how do you find the person who's at the, just the right level? Uh, there is a meeting of minds the, the, that your mentor or a coach is not trying to push their agenda or their thought process, but allowing you to uh, develop what your uh, primary objective is. It's, it's easy to get swayed by mentors who come in very strongly and say, no, no, throw all this, this is rubbish. I'll tell you what you have to do. You don't want to be in that place because then you know, it can, uh, you're not really achieving what you had set out to do. So selecting the right mentor becomes, uh, I think, a very important skill as well. So do people go back to their professors in school as well? I mean, I understand Thai and being part of these networks, as you suggest, are quite important. Uh, but is the the old uh, sort of school system and uh, alumni professors uh, another way? Absolutely, you're right, I should have mentioned that. But uh, yes, a lot of, the, a lot of uh, colleges are very good when it comes to providing a platform for uh, young entrepreneurs to try out their ideas. They can get technical support from professors. IIT Madras, I know, has got some fantastic uh, uh, startup ecosystem, for instance. IAM Calcutta, which I belong to, has got uh, a modest one, but it's still there. There is a lot of support that gets provided. So uh, they, it, it provides an environment. It maybe provides some kind of intellectual sparring partner, but also through the professors and through these uh, uh, academics, you may be able to reach out to other alums or through your alum network, you can reach out to other alums 
who have experience or who have uh, who are willing to support you we get a lot i get a lot of uh, queries through my alum networks people who come back and say you know i am from i am calcutta i am doing this can i uh, talk to you so yeah that it, it is and then you tend to be a little more sort of uh, softer saying yeah i must listen to them too that, yeah so 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 it's quite important to belong to the right institutions day one and maybe if we don't to maybe try and do a degree or some something in one which you know in the post graduate level which helps if indeed you want to be a startup so how you prepare yourself to be that startup would be important to get access as well uh, education institutions etc you know uh, i have just so many more questions and every time i meet you that i learn something but let me turn this over to uh, somveer uh, somveer in case there are any questions from the audience otherwise i can keep asking questions so we we have a few questions and and uh, i think uh, uh, i'll kind of just uh, uh, i mean these are these are collected from the audience and therefore both of you so I'll, let me ask you the first question which is said that many women have become successful bankers in recent times especially in india what makes them especially successful in this in this uh, in, in in this area so i think meena alluded to the fact that it's clear that women don't have a disadvantage when it comes to understanding finance and math uh etc so uh, i think underlying it is just uh, the education uh, system itself uh, in our country which has enabled uh, women to educate ourselves to a level where it isn't a challenge to enter the bfsi sector i think a second reason why you see so many uh, women bankers is the environment was one of the first to open up to accept us as women uh you know it's it's it was more urban for one so easy easier to work in large cities than it is in small uh we didn't have to beat the streets meeting kirana merchants and trying to sell product so i think the marketing companies or uh, the large you know unilevers of the world initially would not have been hiring women because they didn't feel women could cope in the field as a banker you don't have to be out in the field stomping the streets so an office environment is much safer easier to manage easier to access that one toilet even if it's on the fourth floor uh so i think that again enabled uh, more women to thrive in the banking system and then for every success that happened uh others followed so the more women that they were there the more others joined saying hey if she can do it so can i and that journey ends in uh, you know someone like an arundhati coming right through the state bank of india system and rising to the top job of the biggest bank in the country and india of course you know when i was ceo there was uh, there only been one uh, public sector bank here just a year earlier uh, when uh, and that was a very sick bank that she took over and actually turned around so we had that but we had very few but if you look that you know just 6 years later uh, we had this whole slew of uh, uh, people come in as ceos so the journey you know it begins to see geometric progression and i think uh, india has been unique in terms of having so many women ceos as bankers and it's you know not just banks but mbfcs uh, life insurance companies the financial sector uh, had a, a lot of leadership there no absolutely and 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 i and i kind of really believe that i i used to work in city back in the day and i realized i i could we could see that that the level playing field that these fbfss kind of give to people kind of is is why that there's such fantastic uh, 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 quality there uh, uh, uh meena now to you i mean this is a question that just come and uh, in fact to both of you is is uh any tips for entrepreneurial couples to maintain professional and personal gaps specifically when it comes to working closely <laughs> with your partners i mean uh, so the 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 person writes that me and my husband often forget that we are partners inside the house as well as in office uh, <laughs> meena that's for you yeah meena i like this <laughs> um i think um a healthy dose of respect for each other's competencies is the first and foremost and uh, i think we we've been blessed that both of us come with very complementary competencies so so what uh, he does what ganesh does is something that uh, i i don't want to overshadow he does so well so why would i even try and second guess and vice versa what i do he thinks is absolutely the best why would he want to question me so if you can create those clear spaces where each of you are very competent 
and you can create a good deal of uh, respect for each other is uh, uh, the, probably the first thing. Second is that, I mean, the once you're at work, you're at work. I mean, it, it is, the, the business becomes the, the primary purpose and both of you are working to make sure that the business is uh, successful. So you're not thinking about each other as, um, as a part of a couple, but you're talking about each other as co-workers, just like you work with anybody else. It's, uh, it, it, it's not very difficult to uh, move into that mode and uh, enough women have worked in corporate or otherwise along with uh, their loved ones. And I don't see that as a problem at all. If you are very clear what your objective in life is, and in the, if, it's, if you're doing a startup, there is no space for thinking and you have to make sure first of all it survives then it thrives so you're not thinking about each other and your personal relationships and those just don't come into the place at all i completely agree so i think meena's hit the nail on the head i mean it really springs from the respect for each other and uh, i think uh, in my case while we weren't in a business together uh, we started the India Sanitation Coalition together. Yeah. And I actually uh, had the huge benefit of a husband who had worked in the social sector for 15 years. He went from the corporate sector into the social sector. And the knowledge, understanding, patience of working with NGOs, et cetera, that yeah. he brought uh, was uh, very, very important for me because I you know, was so used to a corporate agenda and timelines and uh, working with this type of people. Where, which was quite different. So running an NGO is very different to just being part of a think tank and working in other spaces. So that learning for me was huge. And uh, I, he had had such huge success with some of the work he had done with Seva, bringing Seva to work with the corporate sector, using the same patience and ability to bring uh, Seva close to the corporate partnerships that he had built with them or for them uh, was all part of the journey. So understanding what we do not know and being able to uh, depend on your partner to help you therein is critical. And the other, right through my corporate career, I was very fortunate to have a husband who came from the corporate sector. Uh, was, he was my mentor, my guide. He was the one who could tell me where I was going wrong. He was the one who you know, just grounded me so that I didn't get too carried away with my successes, but also who was the one who helped me when I sank into a hole to help me pull out of it and start again. So it's uh, so much of that EQ, the emotional connect, which comes from the love and respect you get from uh, anyone uh, who's close to you. And you're very fortunate if it is in your partner. In fact, uh, one of the learnings from my book was clearly how important fathers were in this relationship as well. For every one of these successful women, the father was very much the mentor and guide so I say this with uh, deep respect for all the men out there, that the role you play as a father, as a husband is critical in the success of every one of us as women. Well said. Wow, so thank you so much for that. I mean, I have two daughters and, and I'm taking real no close notes because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, they are my retirement plans. I mean, no, I'm just, I mean <laughs> you're doing well. You're doing well to place that trust. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have one last question and and uh, and I know I've taken too much time in your busy schedules and thank you so much for doing this this is really inspiring for us is that you know while you were growing and you were personally growing as well while you were growing your businesses uh, 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 this is a question for the real new generation what is that one book that you want to read what is that one source of information that you want to keep on going back to it or something or what is that one uh, story that has changed your life uh, that you could share with our, our audience so that they could go ahead and kind Kind of do that as well. Uh, I know it's different for different people, but <laughs> any point, <laughs> any pointers. Mina, oh, thank you, then <laughs> <laughs> for lobbing that into my code. Uh, I would say that uh, there have been multiple, at, uh, and uh, they've had different impacts on me. Very long back, I read the book on uh, the power of now um, by Eckhart Tolle, and uh, that really, at a personal level, at a at a spiritual level has helped me remain centered through all the ups and downs that you go through. How do you still don't lose your balance? The other book that I, I, rea I realized that I've been trying to follow some of those principles, but which is really very, very helpful to coalesce what my thinking is, is a book called The Mindset by, by Dr. Carol Dweck, S. Dweck, I believe. 
which talks about this continuous growth mindset you know you it is you don't there is no destination for your uh, for your learning there is no destination for your competence there is no comparison the, the point is not to say am i better than a or b or c am i improving myself day after day after day that if i can do that then i'm there are many things that come out of that it's not just that your business is better you are a better person you are a better human you are a better mother all of these flow from the, the willingness to constantly uh, uh, put your ego down and say i have to learn i have to do more there is something better for me from where i am so you know i'll i'll move away from the books because uh, the uh, books as you can see behind me are my passion and i read anything <laughs> and everything uh, you know on management and uh, uh, early influences that came were really uh, reading uh, you know aut autobiographies of people like golda meir who was uh, the, the one of the first women prime ministers anywhere in the world of israel yeah. as in the case uh, yeah. even ayn rand because she had such strong women protagonists uh, so you know i naturally gravitated to these but i think the learnings one has from individual journeys around us are so huge uh it's not just from every good boss but even a bad boss because a bad boss teaches you what not to do mm -hmm. uh that you learn from every experience uh i learned from an executive assistant who came through riot hit mumbai at uh, the time when the trains and all had stopped uh guidance was out there to all of us not to even attempt to come to us these were in the days before we had mobile phones uh so people just you know it was all word of mouth uh, in terms of hey guys don't try and get there and i come to office uh and you know literally with my running kids and track suit because i didn't know if i could even drive the car back through uh, the chaos in the streets but there was my executive assistant having left her 3 year old kid with a neighbor and she come from a distance twice mine to be at the office uh, why because she believed she may be required and i was just so uh obviously delighted to have her there because it helped but so uh worried about how she would get back but that passion for work uh that desire to actually be part of the system is uh you know it can be anywhere and it was there in an executive assistant of mine who knew that she didn't have to be there but wanted to be there and i think when she did that i was like my god who am i to even be thinking twice about having come to work should i have come and so i went in every day after even though i stopped her coming saying look if she has the spirit to make it through yeah. the system i must have it that much more as someone in the leadership team to be there when i'm required to be there so uh, uh, i think these are the learnings we can have from everyone around us small or big yeah. and pick up the best in what we see and make that part of our journey Wow, I got goosebumps. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Meena. Thank you so much, uh, Nana. This has been absolutely fantastic for us. Um, uh, we've, we've been able to get a snapshot into two absolutely wonderful entrepreneurs, uh, wonderful people who have been able to kind of grow their personal lives and personal kind of careers along with making a difference in this world. Uh, and uh, the reason why we wanted to do this in this format is we want to be able to showcase this to a, a billion other people out there saying that, and not just women, just billion other people out there saying that, guys, there's a long way ahead, and this is what how we need to get there. Thank you so much for your time. I won't take any more. And thank you so yes. much. For and so thank you, thank you, and uh, good luck to getting more entrepreneurs into Punjab. Yeah. For the Punjab. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Sumi. Thanks, Nana. Wonderful. Yeah. Bye, Meena. Always so Bye. good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.